So, hello. Nice afternoon, everybody. Um, so once again, welcome here at uh, this year's FrostCon. Um, we had some uh, smaller technical difficulties, so therefore I uh, want to keep uh, my talking to minimum. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, please uh, remember, if you like the talk, if you don't like, please give us some feedback uh, via the FrostCon program website. Uh, you can rate uh, the lectures you see here, there, and uh, we would kindly ask you to do so. Um, if you are too lazy to do this, then uh, you can vote uh, when going outside. There are some buttons to push where you can say how you like the talk. So that's even easier. Um, so our next talk is about how to work in different environments with uh, agile teams. And um, it's very nice today we have uh, Elke Moritz uh, who can share um, her experiences and hopefully will also uh, from the last 12 years. So, uh, please give a very kind applause uh, to Elke. Hello everybody, it's very nice to be here again at FrostCon. I was a volunteer here several years ago, but I've never really given a presentation at FrostCon, so it's really nice to do this. When I talked to colleagues who are um, agile coaches or people who have been to conferences, they often say that um, most talks are about how agile should be done or how agile should work. What I want to talk today about is uh, things that we have tried and um, that may not have worked for a long time, may have worked for a certain time, things that we have tweaked, and in general, how um, working as a QA uh, um, works as, uh, uh, in agile teams. So I got started back in the 80s with the Commodore 64, like many of you probably. I'm a big Terry Pratchett fan and I love to travel. But in real life, well, I studied computer science in Kaiserslautern, also with uh, Oliver and Michael, who will be presenting next. Um, I worked with them at Linux Talk. We organized the conference for many years, up until 2014. And in the Linux, Linux Talk, you may know that we developed our own conference software, and um, we tried a few things agile-wise, tried a few softwares, but mainly it worked that uh, we were sitting either remotely on a phone conference session or in the same room. And I said to Kester, oh, I need this functionality. Can you implement this? And Kester implemented that. And then I tried it out and tested it. And then, yeah, that's how we did software development. There was no real process involved. And when I worked at universities with virtual reality, uh, virtual reality, I think we have come a long way, but it's still in the state where it's mostly about demos. And at universities, development works like that, that one or two people work on a certain project. There's no real software development process. And once the person leaves the university, the knowledge is gone. So there's no real documentation and no real uh, ways of working. So when I left universities and went into the industry, I said, OK, I first want to get an overview of the whole project because I was fed up with just looking for bugs for hours in the code or cert looking at certain places in the code where to put this one call and spending a whole afternoon just with that. I wanted to know what the whole project was about. So the first company I worked for was a medical imaging pr uh, product where we did softwares for radiologists and for hospitals and that of course needed a certain process. But since we had um, customers from medical um, institutions, we had this waterfall process and we started to switch to Agile in that um, company. After three years, I switched to Nokia. Um, Nokia in Berlin, we were doing everything related to maps. And then you may have followed the news. Uh, we did Symbian, we did Windows Phone, we did MIMO, Amigo, and then eventually um, the mobile phone business was sold off to Microsoft, but we stayed in Berlin uh, working on maps. We became Here Technologies, which is now owned by a consortium of different companies, mainly from automotive uh, industry. And we do still, um, yeah, every, I, I say everything related to maps, from uh, navigation systems in cars to uh, IoT tracking solutions. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting world. 
but it has been also a very interesting time because uh, we jokingly say we have five seasons. We have uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, and reorg season. And nearly every year we have some kind of reorgs in the company. So I've been in a lot of projects over all of the years. Some and some we worked for several years on one software. Sometimes we would just worked a few months. Some software was released. Some software was cancelled. So it has been a very interesting journey. I'm also someone who always likes to do trainings and uh, go to conference a lot. I did the Scrum Master training with Ken Schweber in 2010. I did several um, ISTQB trainings. And if anyone wants to talk about them there, feel free to approach me afterwards. They're mainly uh, still focused on waterfall, not so much on agile trends and ways of working. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, if you want to do something um, more agile, look into more some more of the newer trainings, one of the newer agile certifications. Um, I've also, what I also like is really um, talking about communication in the team. So I've done a few trainings in that area and I will come to that later on. So um, the people who are sponsoring my trip here is our development portal. So we actually have a lot of APIs that are available uh, to people who want to try them out. We have uh, a now a freemium uh, project. And so this year I started getting into testing APIs. Before I did testing on uh, mobile applications, web applications. And uh, the thing about testing APIs for me, it's a new world. So I am uh, like to observe how people actually use APIs. Um, I like to observe if at hackathons, for example, are the examples good? And what I'm seeing is um, that the examples really need to be good. They need to be cross APIs, especially since we're offering 20 or more APIs as different products. But the um, examples are often written by developers. So there's not real uh, much user testing going on. So we don't get really feedback on, are the examples any good? Are they useful? Do they help you in using the APIs? So we. I see myself as a QA, and quality insurance is assurance is much more than um, just testing or checking, because we evaluate the test results. We also are the people who ask a lot of questions. We ask, why is something done, or why is something not done, and what are the risks of doing so or not doing so? So a tester has to be really good in asking questions. We are also usually good at proofreading, and we are often the ones in agile projects, especially who are doing doc documentation, because if there's no real, um, well, readme guides or, or user manual, then our comments in Jira are back actually the knowledge base that there is. So if you want to find out what are the details of a project, how does it really work, or what doesn't work, well, you have to go to our comments and read them. We make sure usually that nothing is forgotten in a release. So we remind everybody, hey, um, did you think of this? Did you think of that? And um, because we do so, testing takes always time. So because of us, the releases often take longer. That's why we're not the most popular people in the team, because Usually, if, if we find a bug, we have to go to someone and say, oh, we, I think this was because of your commit. And then they say, oh, it works on my machine. And then we have to tell them, well, yeah, maybe you should investigate. And thus, we're often seen as uh, pretty pessimistic also, because we always want to break things. We think of the worst case all the time, the worst thing that can happen. Um, and we are often told to smile a bit more, not be so angry, but it's okay to be in a bad mood. I mean, everybody has crappy days, so everybody is allowed to have crappy days, even in the team. It's just that it's important that in the team we communicate well and that we, that we get along well and that they know that it's I'm not the evil QA who wants to tell you that you're always breaking things. It's just because I want to make the product better. So my observation in general is that we QAs are often much more really quiet people, pretty introverted, while PMs or product managers, product owners, and also designers, they are much more often extroverts because they have to be very enthusiastic about the product. They have to sell the product and make people, everybody motivated to work on it. Well, we are the ones who find bugs well, and say, oh, this can go wrong, yeah. And why didn't you think of this? 
so um, it's interesting to learn about how people, uh, what communication is needed to bring your point across. And that's why in our company, the, we did this Myers-Briggs in type indicator. Some people say that's more something like horoscopes for software developers. It's um, a test with um, different personalities that tells you that you're an introvert or an extrovert and how you prefer to communicate. Um, I did it a few times and then I must say that depending on which phase I'm in, if I'm more in an um, introverted phase or sometimes I'm, uh, I'm very enthusiastic and want to do things, it can happen that my results switch to an extroverted result. So this is not set in stone, but it may help you in case you're looking for a job and you need some, some words to describe yourself, then just take this quick test and you will find out more about you. The other thing we did was the uh, team management profile. So we did a um, new project with a small team and everybody had to fill out a questionnaire. And we found that our product owner, for example, he was more the creator innovator, the one who was very enthusiastic about the product and really wanted to get it going, but he was totally bored with all this bureaucracy and all the paperwork and everything. Our developers were mainly in the orange area, the, the assessor developers, and we QAs, we, um, we fell into this concluder producer category because we wanted to get things done and get things done properly and on time. So we wanted to finish them. Um, one interesting thing was that one of our QAs his test results were in the orange section, and he was never really so happy as a QA. So eventually, after a few years, he actually switched and went into development. So these things can give you a hint of, is this what you're doing really what is what you like, what you enjoy? But they can also help the team to check, do we have any gaps, do we... Well, if we don't have any people who like to finish stuff and want to release, then yeah, we may have a problem, right? So our usual team setup is um, often on a project we can have one or five, up to five um, scrum teams. And each scrum team may be cross-platform, so we may have two iOS developers, two Android and two web. Sometimes uh, one or two backend developers as well. We usually also have two QAs in the team and one product owner and sometimes an agile coach. This depends really on the project setup. Right now we're doing without agile coaches. Fortunately, some of them have left the company, so we need to hire some more. But um, since lots of us have done agile for a few years, it's not that big of a problem right now. Mm. One thing is we have dedicated people for um, user interface design, um, and designers, and usability experts. And they're usually responsible for multiple teams, so they're not sitting with us. Um, we also have external contractors um, in other countries, for example, in Tallinn, in Poland, in China, who help us with testing, who help us also with development, um, who help us if the bus factor strikes, you know, the bus factor that uh, how many people need to be hit by a bus until the project dies or is in pretty big danger. So if one of our two QAs, for example, goes on vacation, then we get external support for testing so that we always have two people taking care of things. And we often have, um, we have DevOps. They're mostly in separate teams. Sometimes they go into the teams for a while to set up the pipelines. Our company at here, for right now, we are very international. 60% are not from Germany. Um, we are from all kinds of different backgrounds, different cultures. It's also that um, not everybody pronounces English uh, like it should be pronounced. And then when we do this in the meeting very often, then everybody adapts to that. That's why right now we, everybody says Jira. In other companies, they may say Jira. So, but we got used to pronouncing it that way. We're about a thousand people in Berlin alone. We are about 6,000 now worldwide. And it's difficult to get uh, to know what everybody is really doing because we have so many projects running at the same time. Um, 
what we have tried to communicate a bit better is to have cross-team meetings. Um, we had communities of practice, which could be that we just met in the uh, rooftop garden and discussed what everybody was doing. We tried Android breakfasts because we were doing a bitty, pretty big project um, with a lot of refactoring. So this was our refactoring breakfast, where every week the developers discussed what needed to be changed. Um, someone else did a pizza on Android. Every Wednesday evening there was pizza. And we had some talks about Android, um, what changed in the newest version, what uh, we need to take care of when testing. Yeah, it, it really depends. We did all these things for several months, sometimes even years, but we're not doing them right now. I also try to meet with um, QAs every week for a coffee. We have two kitchens on each floor in the building, so we have lots of uh, possibilities to drink and meet coffee. Um, but yeah, that worked for a few weeks, but then people didn't show up. So we thought, okay, we need meetings with an agenda. So now we're trying to have regular QA sync ups with an agenda, but if nobody puts anything off the agenda, we cancel the meeting. So um, yeah, getting people to meet, and talk, especially if they're introverts, it's not that easy. One thing that has been going on for quite a while is our quality guild. It's a meeting of um, all the QAs in the IoT department, and we usually do um, reports about conferences we've been to or give the presentations that we want to present at the conferences uh, and use this for knowledge sharing. This works pretty well, but the majority of the QAs um, have a Q the same QA lead. And since this QA lead is the one who invites to these meetings, sometimes it feels a bit like in school that they just go there because their line manager is organizing the meeting. Um, and they're not going there really to participate and exchange and, and be active. So it's something we probably have to work on to um, yeah, find better ways of knowledge sharing. Um, we have been doing various ways of Agile. We have Scrum teams, we have Kanban teams. Um, some teams try to do it by the book with everything like estimation and saying how much work we estimate this issue will have and, and how much work we have done and how much work is left. Very often we modify the process um, because this doesn't really work out. The whole burn down thing in most teams doesn't work. I, right now I'm in a Kanban team, so we don't do any big team meetings. We have a backlog when we pull stuff in uh, regularly. Um, and it feels good to have a pretty lightweight process. So, mm. Sorry. The um, retrospective for us is the most important meeting. It's mainly because we're not only reflecting on what um, we want to improve, what has gone well. Um, sometimes we ask also what we have learned in the last two weeks. Um, it's also something where we often have a mood indicator where in the end everybody has to paint a smiley how they feel currently. And this is then if, if right now everybody is more in a bad mood, then of course this is um, communicated to the line management or to the higher manager that the mood in the team currently is not so good for whatever reasons there are. It's, um, the risk of a story that the story is not finished is usually um, depends a lot on the dependencies on other teams. So we have to eat our own dog food. So we are often using the APIs from other teams. So we're using a mobile SDK and we have a team that does the translations and we have a team that does analytics and we have the designers that are sitting on another floor. So um, we found, for example, that the design specification that needs to be ready before we can start a story because otherwise we wait half of the sprint for uh, new icons or new designs. Um, we are always running the risk of switching into agile uh, and not being really agile because we have to have the design specs beforehand or because we are when we are in a big company there have to be some gates which um, a gate that says, okay, you can start development on this project, or a gate that, yes, this project can now be released. So it's, it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes to find the right balance. 
What we found for voting, if we use it, sometimes in some teams we don't use voting, that one is a button. A button is the easiest thing that you can implement. It can be pushed and uh, it can be easily tested. A button can have a certain color, it can have a press state. Um, so it's it's a really small unit. Um, while an eight an eight point story is something that's a lot of work, and we are very confident that we will make it, and there are no dependencies on other teams. It's just we know that it's really a lot of work. A thirteen already is very risky, usually because of dependencies on other teams. So usually we are waiting that they have a release of their newest version and they promise that it will be happening in two days. And if it doesn't happen, then there's a risk that it will not work. Or if there's a bug in their release, then we are also at risk. A 20 is definitely too big and needs to be split. That's our experience. And and we are really lucky if we can manage to get uh, two 13-point stories done in a two-week sprint. There's often the risk to do development for certain people or groups. So if the CEO says your product and says, oh, I really want to have this in, then it could be that um, no matter how tight your schedule is or if you've started a sprint or something, that yes, you will do what the CEO says. There may also be coming important demos coming up. You may, may I don't know how it works in the free software world, but very often when there's a big conference and you announce that there's, oh, there's a new release and we would like to really sh have the release at this conference, you're probably in a similar situation that you're pushing for this event. Uh, same with yeah trade shows. It always amazes me that I always ask, oh, do we want to show something at CES, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in January? Do we want to show something at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona? And we know when these dates are. And then suddenly, two months before, somebody says, oh, we really want to show this. We have to change all our plans. We want marketing wants to show this. So could also be that whoever shouts the loudest and complains the most is heard. So if someone bugs you all the time that he really wants this button not in green but in red, then maybe eventually you will yeah, do this just to keep this person quiet. And another recent trend is hype-driven development. Someone sees a new technology, for example, microservices, says, oh, this is cool. We have to really do microservices. And they just start talking about this all the time. And then, OK, you say, OK, let's try microservices. And then you realize that nobody really did it to that scale that you need it. And nobody has the expertise in your team. And you run into lots of troubles. And, and it takes much more time than you anticipated. So for our ways of working um, with these agile meetings and so on, we found that the backlog grooming is really important that you prepare a story before into it goes into a planning meeting. And it's best to do the backlog grooming even in a two-step setting, so that first the designers with maybe one QA and maybe one developer and the POs, they prepare the stories and do all their discussions and arguments. And then once it's pretty ready, you go into a second session where you really define all the acceptance criteria, so that the story is ready when you go into the planning. Um, and then once the, you say that the story is done, well, you have a definition of done de uh, defined, and I, I will do on further slides, I will show you our current definition of ready and our definition of done. Yeah, and when we're doing, for example, release testing, we have tried out a few bug bashes. That means that when we have to test on multiple platforms, like on, we have to test on Android 6, 7, and 8, and iPhone 7, and iPhone 8, and iPhone 10, and also on all and four different web browsers and three different Mac browsers. Then we sit with several QAs in a room. Everybody has a, diff has a few different devices, and we do basically the same stuff in one room. Optimally, one of the QAs should be the lead and give like some hints on, let's test this now, let's do that now. Unfortunately, we're all introverts, so it often is that we're all sitting there quietly and everybody does their testing. So it's, it's something, yeah, we are working on this. Since 
we're this big company with um, usability experts, we are doing uh, user research pretty often. We even have a user research lab where we invite people from outside, we give them the app or what we want to test, we give them something that they should do. For example, plan a route from uh, Alexanderplatz to Kurfürstendamm, because we're in Berlin and we do maps. And then we observe them and record them on video and see what they're doing and see if they're finding all the functionality that there is. We sometimes just do this informally with colleagues that we say, oh, hey, do you want to meet in the cafeteria? I want to show you something. Yeah, But it's, it's a good thing that we're doing this because very often uh, we get feedback that we wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So one of the most important things, in my opinion, is our definition of ready. So it's a checklist that we have to go through before we say that a story is ready to go into a sprint. It's First of all, everybody should understand, of course, what the story is about, and the title should be meaningful. It can happen that, um, well, that the title is formulated in a way that it doesn't really have to do anything with what the story is actually about. And that's something we want to really avoid. The title should already say what the story is about. It's also that we, QAs are always the ones who ask about risk. What's the risk of doing the story? But we also need to ask what's the risk that we, if we don't do that story, because sometimes someone come up, comes up with a story that's not really that important for the release. It's not a story that may not be part of the minimal viable product. And then the question is, when do we have to do the story? And do we have to do it now or can we wait some more? We recently had the situation where we wanted to do some uh, UI refinements, but there was a team in our UI department who was working on a new framework. So the question is, do we do our uh, refactoring now or do we wait until the framework is ready? Can we help them to get the framework ready faster so that we can do this? And um, so that's really a question, not always accept the stories that are presented to you, but also question, uh, do we have to do this now? Can we not wait two weeks or four weeks if your sprint iterations are two-week iterations? And it's important that the acceptance criteria are clearly defined because usually for us QAs, this is what we test. So if something, we need to know if something is part of the scope or if it's not part of the story. And the more detail the acceptance criteria are, the easier it is for us to start testing, even testing before the code is ready. And if we already know what the story is about, then it also helps to make uh, create the subtasks immediately and not do that uh, when we do the sprint planning. Usually when a story is finished, we QAs also uh, are now adding this, really this comment as a comment to the story in Jira. So we make a check that there's end-to-end -end tests, that um, automation has been applied, that the design spec is ready, we have a database for all the strings, so there shouldn't be any hard-coded strings. The acceptance criteria have been tested. UX has reviewed and it said everything is good and we've done all the pixel pushing that they wanted so that it looks exactly the way they wanted. And all the linked issues have been closed. And then we um, resolve the story and give it to the PO so that they can close it. And that's currently our process, and we, we think that works really well for us. Other things we have tried is post-mortem retrospectives. After a project is finished, that we do a retrospective not about a sprint, but about the whole project. Or when a project starts, that we do a roadmap planning with a team, where we plan the MVP, the minimal viable product, what's the minimum that has to be in the first release. When something goes wrong, for example, um, our servers are not reachable for the whole weekend, then we do a root cause analysis, which means we ask why did this happen, and we ask why so many times until we find the root cause. And we try to get uh, some ideas of how we can prevent this for the future. We've also... As I said, we do two week sprints right now, but we've also had a sprints where we did uh, three weeks 
and two and a half week was the actual sprint and the last two days were kind of research days where everybody could try out new things, some technology they'd heard about or um, basically do stuff that nowadays we do in spikes. Um, we also had full time, a uh, full research week every few months uh, where we could try out stuff that was related to the project or even unrelated things. Um, and we've tried internal hackathons where we just did three days of implementing together things that we wanted to do for the project, like looking at this UA UI framework and if, seeing if we can help them to get it out faster. Yes, we agree that every meeting invite needs an agenda. If a meeting invite comes and doesn't have an agenda, we are free to reject it. And meeting notes sh should be taken and they should go in the wiki, but the problem is unfortunately that everybody who has worked with the wiki knows that after a few years it becomes a big mess and it's difficult to find stuff. So. In an optimal world, you would also think about not only refactoring code, but also refactoring the wiki content. But uh, we never have time to do that. One of the very, very interesting things we did, mm, we have this um, WeGo product. That's basically what was once called uh, Nokia Maps, then it became Here Maps, then it became Here We Go, and then it became WeGo.here.com which is our free uh, navigation software on Android, iOS, and mobile, uh, on web. And it has been out since four or five years. So it's, has, it's, it's very old in mobile terms. And we tried a phase where we shuffled the five scrum teams that were working on it every four to six months. So we gave, we got missions from management, something like, um, introduce bike routing and uh, on this topic it said okay introduce bike routing and then our NPS our net promoter score like uh, how people like our product that will increase or we will have more active users in the first seven days of the week and we want this feature to be rolled out to 100% of people in a certain time um, so usually we had about four teams mission teams uh, and we had one watchtower team that took care of the general bug fixing, maintenance, pipeline fix and everything. Um, and every four to six months we got a new mission so we reshuffled the team. Um, which meant that my colleague who loved bike riding and went to the bike routing team while well, I don't ride bikes, uh, I went to the taxi and car sharing team. So every few months you had to adapt a bit to new people, which also isn't everybody's thing, especially if they're introverts. So um, we all agree that we learned a lot because we tried a lot of new things like A-B testing and rollouts and so on. But we're not sure if it was really a su success, which is mainly due to management. They, because they ended the phases after four to six months and when we were not really done with everything, because what we learned that um, this whole process of A-B testing and rollouts takes time. Usually you add a feature flag in one sprint, then you let it run, roll out to a few people. Usually a rollout works that you give it to 5% of English speaking, then you give it to 10% of everybody, then you give it to 100% of everybody. So you need a certain um, time to collect data and observe how many people are using it and are they using it the way you want it to be used. And then you need another sprint to clean up the feature flag and everything. So if you're just using these three sprints, it's already six weeks. So it's already quite a big chunk of your four to six months mission. So we didn't really have time to do as much as we wanted in that time. Um, it also... A trend that I'm observing now is that since we did these rollouts, um, people got more and more um, well afraid. So they're using more and more rollouts right now, um, feature flags right now, hiding everything, even smaller feature behind feature flags, even though we're saying once a story is finished, we have all these QA 
tasks in place, we should have all the testing in place, our quality should be up to date, otherwise we wouldn't say that the story is finished. So the question is now, are we not trusting our QA process at the moment because we're having feature flags for so many things? Um, that's why I'm saying we have one of our um, company mission statements is be bold. So we really need to think of being bolder again. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we do testing. Mm. Um, as testing, we do smoke tests, which is basically start the app, plan a route, get the guidance, doesn't crash, good, all is fine. A regular BIT, a basic acceptance test, is test of basic functionality. Test all parts of the app, uh, just the basic stuff, no, no edge cases or error cases. When we do a release testing, we, of course, test the latest things we've added since the last release, and we do some regression testing, checking that nothing got broken in between. And um, over the years, we have gone from writing down test cases and executing these written test cases to doing exploratory testing, which means we create a test plan, which is a, list, a checklist of all the things we want to look at, and we create a mind map of all the areas that there are in the app, and then we just explore, which is really nice when you do uh, mapping software because you can say, okay, I explored Europe last time and did my routing there, now I'll just do something in Australia and see if there are any problems. And we've really found problems when we just tried another region in the world. So our pipeline usually looks like this. We have some commit hooks that check if we have uh, spaces or tabs in the code that check that all the comments are in a certain format, like if we have references to automated tests that there are, include the Jira number or the, the test number. We have unit tests in place, of course, and then when you do the commit, it goes into Garrett, and we do Garrett reviews. Everything has to be reviewed. Then the automated tests are run once the commit is merged, and automated tests can be espresso tests, cucumber, nightwatch, whatever there is for the current platform. And then we get our master build, which are the latest commits, where all the tests have been run with a dev development backend. CIT usually is a master with the production backend. And then the pro and that's what we get for every commit that is done. And production release is um, maybe manually triggered, or it may be... Um, something that's not built automatically all the time. And that's then the, the whole thing that has been tested with the production backends. Um, everybody makes mistakes, so everything has to be uh, reviewed in our process. Also, the automated tests and also a test plan is always done, reviewed by another um, tester. We use Garrett so that at least one person has to give a plus one, another one has to give a plus two, and then we merge. And every com uh, Jira, uh, Garrett commit also needs the Jira ID in the comments so that now with our latest plugins, we see in every story what has been changed for that story. The problem is that we often don't have uh, do cross-platform reviews. So the Android developers review the Android code changes, the iOS developers review the iOS code changes, but nobody reviews everything. So that means the Android developers, they, they come up with their own unit tests, the iOS developers come with, up with their own unit tests, but there's no communication between the teams. There can also happen that suddenly on Android, a delay, in a, if you have a bus routing, a delay is everything that's one minute late, and on iOS, everything that's more than one minute late. So you have a discrepancy of the same functionality on the different platforms. That's uh, something that we haven't really tackled yet at the moment. Um, steps of automation that I've seen is that Manual testing is taking so long, let's automate everything so that we don't have to spend so much time on manual testing. Um, then why is the automation taking so long? Well, we're not the better programmers and automation isn't easy peasy, right? 
uh, why are the stories taking so long? Well, we have agreed that every story needs to have something automated. So um, we often run into the trap that eventually we will only start the bare minimum that's necessary to get the story finished. And then, yeah, why is the execution taking so long? We had um, in our WeGo project, we had four digit, four digit espresso tests. So we had more than a thousand, far more than a thousand espresso tests. We had several jobs, Jenkins jobs of running hundred espresso tests and we had them running in parallel. But then what broke our neck is uh, maintenance. So the question is what takes, what makes maintenance so long? Because we have flaky tests, you have to investigate why they are flaky. You're uh, updating the testing framework and then lots of stuff breaks or you have mocking in there and then you change something and also that has to be investigated. And if you have several, uh, even thousand tests, then maintenance takes time. And that's not uh, budgeted usually in your usual sprints. So then in the end, the idea was to let's reduce the number of tests and only test what's really important. Um, yeah, I just talked about maintenance. Um, there's also the problem of the limits of automation. You really can't automate everything. You cannot automate that if there's, if you're showing a phone number of a restaurant in your app and someone taps on the phone number, then you're leaving the app and you're opening the, uh, making a phone call, the call app on the phone. And that's, and then how do you get back to the app? That is cannot easily be automated. Then our tests are often in English only. They're not taking into account any right to left or internationalization issues. We're also not automating contrast and colors. Usually espresso tests only check that a button is there. It doesn't check if the text fits or if it looks good and if it's on the right position. We only check that it's there somewhere. Yeah. So um, a lot of things, a lot of times you cannot go without manual testing, especially if you have a visually engaging, big interactive app. Um, so, and um, one of the funny, th fun things is internationalization because, uh, units, easy to automate, easy to test. Celsius, Fahrenheit, miles, kilometers. But time zones, doing routing across different time zones or routing or having meetings when the daylight savings times changes is a pretty tricky thing to automate and to test. Also, um, all these internationalization and localization things, um, that tie, for example, has slightly higher character and that's thus the spacing between the lines needs to be higher. Or that if you uh, support right to left, um, you have the scroll bars on the other side and if you get addresses that mix right to left and left to right, then the formatting looks ugly and you can try a lot, but usually it looks ugly. There's also the fun thing, um, I see I'm running out of time, so I have to hurry up a bit. Uh, the China shift that some people haven't heard of, it's if you're not in China, everything, all the geo coordinates are shifted. There's a Wikipedia article about that. So you need, if you have routing in China, you need to have testers there that actually are testing that your software works because you cannot test it from here. And if you're working with testers in China and Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan, it's best that you have written test cases and that they're phrased in a way that they can easily understand because otherwise uh, they may not run them as thoroughly as you want to get them run. Um, so we always, when we were Nokia, we had China support and we had testers there in China. Right now, I think our product doesn't have China support because now everything is in the cloud and we are using AWS for a lot of things and uh, China requires that their data is always in China and we haven't set up all that stuff yet. Um, yeah, I said... <laughs> After a while, you run into the phase where you want to do refactoring and developers always want to re do refactoring after a few months. Designers also want to do refactoring or UI refresh after a few months. But we testers, uh, unfortunately, we often don't review our tests, especially if we have several hundreds or even thousand automated tests. Why shouldn't we do a review and a refactoring of the tests and reevaluate if we really need them? And another thing is um, we always forget to review and declutter analytics events. 
you may know that in, if you have a mobile app, you have something that's called a drawer, like a drawer that you can expand to half, half of the screen or to full screen. And when we introduced that, our designers said, oh yes, we should track that in analytics. Um, and we tracked that in analytics if people were expanding that to full screen. But then nobody really looked at the results. Nobody was really interested in, yeah, what does it tell us that some people expand this and some people don't? But since we started tracking these events for all other stories that actually introduced the drawer, the developer said, okay, we, ha we once implemented these events in analytics, now we also have to implement them here. So we never really questioned why we did track these things. And then for analytics, the important thing is, um, why do we track these information? What questions do we want to get answered, right? And um, we also have to make sure for us testers, analytics is usually a pain to test because we cannot automate it. So we have to test that we're sending the right events at the right time. We have to test that they're received uh, in the way that we want them to. And then of course that we can do whatever we want to do. So we once had the grand idea to track um, the position of users if they have ran into a problem. So we implemented the events, everything was fine. And then we saw, um, we used Amplitude at that time as our um, software to look at what we received. Well, that some people were not using English, but they used some kind of number format that uh, we couldn't really read some right-to-left languages because we had forgotten to send the events in English. We were sending them in the device language. So we got results that weren't useful. It's the same that we got um, users in Germany, Deutschland and Alemannia. We just couldn't accumulate the data that we got. We also found that geo-coordinates are very precise and we didn't, we sent too many digits after the comma, so we couldn't really uh, pinpoint where the users were. We would have had to run all the data that we collected through another software and show it on the map, and we never really did. So this whole tracking of that event was in vain. And um, yeah, if you're doing analytics, you also, Another thing is that you, of course, have to do it cross-platform. So you have to you have the same events with the same naming uh, on Android, on iOS, and web. Uh, otherwise, you cannot really compare the data if you have a product that has the same functionality on the different platforms. Well, we users also deal, we QAs also deal with user feedback. So usually in our app, we have something like sending feedback, which includes this, uh, would you recommend the app to a friend? Please rate on a scale from zero to 10. This is the NPS um, data, the net promoter score. Basically a 10 and a nine is someone who promotes the app, a zero to six is someone who will not promote the, the app, and the seven and eight is neutrals, so we don't really count them. So really the only interesting thing for us is nine and 10. And we QAs usually just monitor things to see if there are any spikes. We also monitor uh, comments that people are sending, um, monitoring regularly the analytics dashboard and then notifying people that if there's something interesting happening. And then um, right now, for example, we have a project that where we have beta users in the company, so we distribute the app through Hockey App, and then we have to reply to all the requests that come in for people who want access and want to try these things. And then, of course, we have a company internal, Yammer, which is like Facebook, where people can send comments, and we also react to all these things. Um, As I said a number of times, we're a big company, so we have to think about security, privacy, and compliance. When I'm talking about analytics, it means that everything is anonymized. So even I have difficulties finding my own data in our analytics database. So when I properly want to test it, I usually send a certain comment with my name, and then I know that I'm the, the only person in Berlin using that phone, sending that comment, that can only be me, so I can see what I send and um, see that. Otherwise, I cannot identify anyone who's sending data. 
Um, we have very strict guidelines for that. We also have or had a team, I don't know what this noise is, is it raining outside? Um, that um, a re link redirection team. So at one time, Nokia was selling music. So there was a music app. And you know that for music, licenses are different depending on in which language, in which country you are. So music licenses are different in England than they are in the US. So you would have to have different legal pages in, diff in English for the different countries. So for our navigation app, I always, uh, we always had the case that if, if someone has a phone set to French, is in Spain, but has a um, British SIM card, in what language would you show them the help pages or the legal pages? And then usually we had a team that defined the rules and we fell back to English even though I think if someone has their phone language set to French, I think they would prefer the, the page in English. But that's the process that was defined by the other team, so we had to follow this process. We're also now having an open source software team, and every software we release has to go to an open source software review by that team. And we have to have open source software notices in the app. In my opinion, there are only two types of people regarding open software notices. Those that don't care at all, those are also the people who are annoyed by cookie notices and don't read legal pages, don't read the disclaimers. And then there are the people who care a lot, especially those that are involved in any open source software project. Of course, they want to know if that big company is using their product and in which version, so they want to be credited properly. Um, Right now, our process that is given by this external team is that we copy all the notices in a big table and then take two columns from this table and concatenate everything, and that's then the notices file that we get. Um, and we hope to review this process in two months or so that it will be in a readable format finally, because right now my complaint is that it's not really readable. I checked uh, when I prepared this talk the um, LibreOffice website and their open source notices is really nice because they always have in bold and headline which project this notice section belongs to. And right now, yeah, this is something we really have to improve. So the thing is processes, um, they may be given from a different team, they may depend on company culture, but I'm really not a fan of processes for the sake of processes. In my opinion, processes have to need to be adapted. You have to try things, and if they don't work, you have to just, yeah, do something, change something, tweak them to make them work. There are so many more things I could talk about. I even had a second talk proposal. It wasn't accepted about that the product is more than just features. Because what I now mainly talked about was uh, functional testing. I didn't talk about performance testing or security testing or all these other types of testing. And I didn't talk about what also is needed for a product. I mean, even LibreOffice, when I downloaded the new version, um, they have a big product page where you can download the app. They have something where you can donate to the product. They have... Yeah, every product needs, besides the obvious features, some kind of splash screen. If you want to have it in an app store, you need an app store description. You need about pages, especially about pages which have the version number, so that if a user has a, reports a bug, then we QAs knows on which version it was reported and can try to reproduce this. There are so many things that make a product that are often not thought of as part of the product when you do the sprint planning or um, when you do the roadmap. All things take time. Even setting up your uh, continuous integration pipeline or defining your release process, that also takes time. And all these things um, contribute to yeah, product taking longer than what you would have expected. But all of this is something that we can talk about later on uh, over a beer or tomorrow when I'll be around or maybe next year in another talk. So thanks for listening. And now I'm open for questions.
Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. So do I think if the length is relevant for QA? Um, yeah, we have discussed this. We have uh, we wanted to go to three-week sprints so that we could do more of the automated tests in the sprint and so that we can also do um, not run so much into the problem that development is finished two days before the sprint ends and QA then has to do all their testing because sometimes you can only do the testing when the product is ready. Um, yeah, but we just agreed to stick to the two weeks. Um, yeah, we were overruled, so. But of course, we have tried three-week sprints. We've also tried one-week sprints. Uh, it, it really depends. What, but what I've found is that it's important that we really put all the QA tasks in Jira so that we create a story for the release testing and put everything in there that needs to be updated, like, re like a task for reviewing the results or a task for updating the Confluence pages and so on, so that the team knows what we actually spend our time on, because otherwise then it's really boring if you're in a stand-up and said, okay, I did some testing and I plan to do some testing today, but that's not really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, if we have any experience with companies who offer uh, to do testing on different uh, Android phones, different platforms. Yes, we have tried that in, I think in WeGo we did that uh, um, for some devices, but on smaller projects there's often not the budget yet, especially if you don't have customers yet and you're just starting with the product, then we just um, look at what is the most common device and then um, we test on these. And it's really not possible nowadays to test on all of these Android phones. I know uh, there was one time where we had problems with uh, Lenovo chipsets and, and certain phone types of phones, but it's really, it's often neglectable the amount of users that are in a product. Um, even with Vigo, where we had several millions of users, often these were just a few. So the important thing is that we have a good crash reporting because uh, web apps, uh, Android and iOS apps, if they crash, that we get a report and that we can investigate this. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if we did try risk-driven development, no, not really, because usually the idea comes from someone in management or so about the product and then yes we just get a roadmap and ideas what we want to do but we're not all these risk driven development but also some kind of behavior driven development that may work in a small product when you get started but not if you have a team that did a prototype and then you put more people on and then you're already in a certain phase of the product it has already been on going on for several months, then it's really difficult to get all these implemented. So now we, we're not really, I think we're not thinking of risks enough. Yeah. That's um, something we really have to work on. Yeah. So I think we're running out of time. Um, Michael and uh, Oh, there's one more question. Well, the definition of ready, we try to look at this uh, at the grooming session when before we say the story is now ready to go into a sprint. And then we can already ask, we have a few default tasks that we can add, something like a UX review, QA review, um, writing the QA test plan. And then, of course, if we already know that certain development tasks are needed or some meetings have to be done with other teams, then we can add them right away. 
I mean, in general, um, if someone has an idea for a subtask or thinks something needs to be done, it's better to document it right away because it can be uh, resolved as obsolete any time later. It's better to document it as long as you remember. So yeah, we have to finish now. So I'll be around for the party. I will be around tomorrow. And you can also find me online in various channels. And it was, I hope to get some more feedback and personal conversations. Thank you very much.